So welcome back to our uh, next installment of uh, the two Neanderthals. Yes, welcome back. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, sort of a phenomena that I observed over the years that I find very interesting and distressing about um, something that's not specifically peculiar to the American culture, but it is definitely predominant, I think, in contemporary society. Um, in a different lifetime, um, I was a firefighter in a small department in Colorado and used to do, uh, we would do from time to time these special event medical standbys. It's where I really first noticed this. Um, was a medical call uh, where they closed off the streets and had like an Oktoberfest kind of thing. And uh, a medical call came in, uh, somebody had passed out on the sidewalk. And it was right in front of this uh, restaurant. It was a college town, so they had a lot of good restaurants. And it was a nicer restaurant with the big plate glass windows in front, right at the sidewalk. And there she is, and the family around, and lots of people milling around at this special event. And so we are we come up to render aid, and uh, um, I happened to look up, and in the sitting in this big plate glass window, there was a couple of tables of customers having lunch. And this couple, they were just chatting away and checking their phones and whatnot, and, and they looked over at me, and they looked down at the scene, and it was... I got the impression they were doing this just almost like they were an observer at at the zoo or watching a TV show or something like that. There was not even a, um, any kind of a glimmer of any, oh, is there anything we can do to help? Or, oh, my goodness, look what's going on out there. Um, that piece of glass served as a barrier between them and us. And so... What happened from that is I started to observe when we would go to some of these calls, medical calls, public medical calls, that bystanders would be just completely complacent. And once in a while, you would catch somebody that would be very um, conscientious and very interested and motivated in helping and wanting to be involved and wanting to render aid. Um, but usually they felt like it seemed like they were almost afraid to try um, and I don't know exactly where that comes from but that's kind of why I wanted to talk about this today because it's a question and I don't have the answer but I'd like to talk about it yeah it sounds like a really fertile topic uh, from my point of view uh, existentially you know topically uh, you know having to do with our sense of agency like who we are and what we're capable of, our sense of responsibility from an existential perspective, our sense of ourselves as uh, free and capable agents who can, through our own efforts and expertise, possibly help people. I think uh, any number of directions we could go with this. Uh, one of the first ones that occurs to me is uh, has to do with sort of the way our society is structured in terms of uh, very narrow ranges of expertise that we're supposed to inhabit, mm. you know, as participants in uh, Western American culture, especially the way you get a, a decent place in our society is you become almost monomaniacally fixated on one relatively narrow, small topic and become an expert on it so that people will hopefully pay you a lot of money for your expertise in that one issue. And that has any number of benefits, I think, for our society. But one of the, the negatives of it is that it's much harder to have sort of a sense for any uh, kind of involvement that would lie outside of our narrow range mm -hmm. of expertise. So when we see someone having physical trouble on the sidewalk somewhere, I think it becomes much easier in a world like ours to think the thought, well, you know, that's not my job. This is above my pay grade. I need to have an expert or some kind of expert needs to be looking at this. Moreover, if I get involved, maybe I'll get sued. Yeah. I think that sort of paranoia litigation. about yeah. litigation and uh, sort of the litigiousness of our culture generally yeah. uh, has, a, has a very paralyzing effect when it comes to being a good Samaritan. I think part of what you're concerned with, Mark, is the question of where have all the good Samaritans gone? Well, and that it's it's 
doubly interesting because every state has good Samaritan laws mm -hmm. for someone who attempts to render aid in, an, in a situation like that. But what I find more interesting after the fact is on the news, um, and, and this um, kind of feeds into some other things that are outside of the topic today, but the news story, for example, would show that somebody jumped in to help and they're like a national treasure all of a sudden. Yeah. They're, they're a hero. Why is it that someone helping their fellow man or woman, as the case may be, is uh, classified as a national hero? Um, why isn't that the rule rather than the exception? Yeah. And then on the other side, the media will either show it that way or they will show uh, the story about the World War II vet that gets mugged on the sidewalk and 30 people walk by before anybody comes to check on the guy and, and render aid or even to call 911. Or check it, check out the situation in any way whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's such a, um, there, it seems like that people in general are so reticent to um, it, it's it's a puzzle, and I think from a Jungian standpoint, it it would seem to be sort of uh, there could be you know some projection there of of the shadow um, of the darkness of, of the person of the the uh, bystander um, seeing something in the other that is uh, troubling or disheartening or. Uh, disconcerting in such a way that um, walking away or standing away or even turning away um, is preferable to embracing the situation at hand and rendering aid to the other. Yeah, I think that's, that, I'm really sort of riding with what you're saying, Mark. So, so then uh, to sort of go a little bit more into that way of looking at it, so someone who uh, has, let's say, faints on the sidewalk uh, suddenly becomes a kind of bearer of a kind of darkness in a way that we have trouble facing in ourselves because what kind of darkness are they a bearer of? Well, they're a bearer, first of all, of the fragility of human existence, which typically we don't want to face, and it makes it more obvious that, well, gee, you know, like things aren't quite as predictable and in in control as we typically like to think. And so someone who falls down on the sidewalk sort of brings that up. I think another element of darkness it, it sort of brings up is uh, how incapable we feel a lot of the time, that we're, we're you know, very limited uh, beings whose capability is, is very limited. And I think that, it, that when someone faints and we feel uh, like, oh my goodness, we feel helpless in a sense to render aid. Unlike a trained first responder such as yourself, I think a lot of people feel like very incapable of perhaps even offering aid, you know, or having anything of value to to sort of add. Um, okay, yeah, I can see that. It still, though, is beyond me to, and part of that is simply my, my personality as an extrovert. It, it's it's beyond me to um, understand how someone would see someone in distress like that until I look at, at it a, a differently and see that, well, it's the unknown, it's the misfortune, and those things bring fear. Um, it's the same reason that people... If there's if you're on an interstate highway and there's a wreck on the other opposite direction lanes you can be guaranteed that these lanes you're in going the other way are going to be slowed mm -hmm. leading up to that accident because everybody they call I guess the, the term is rubbernecking you know yeah. everybody is slowing down to see what happened yeah. they're not going to do anything no so all they're doing is impeding well, everybody else and, and endangering really in a sense everybody else around them but there's a fascination with it we we can't look at it but at the same time we can't look away from it well i think you know a lot of uh in the modern world 
we have a very spectating relation to large swaths of the terrain of life, I think. You know, a lot of it is about, you know, watching things on, oh, I don't know, YouTube, <laughs> you know, and that becomes uh, paradigmatic, I think, for a lot of how we relate to life. And when you think about a, a sort of spectating relation to life, well, what goes into that? Well, you know, a spectating relation is a mostly detached relation. It's a very mm -hmm. uh, distant and to an extent objectifying relation. By objectifying, I mean uh, sort of treating uh, life like a kind of object in a way to be observed, you know? Oh, so we, we either approach it objective, um, passively or actively. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe that's another, another way to phrase oh, I, it. I think it is. In one of my recent videos on my channel, I talked about, uh, entitlement in terms of an internal and external locus, locus of control. control. Uh, and, uh, and basically sort of what the, I'll give you the gist of that. Um, is that a external locus of control is a, is more or less about a way of seeing life where the main forces that determine the quality of our lives and even the reality of our lives come from outside of ourselves. And if you see the world that way very thoroughly, it invites a very passive relation to things that you're, you're insofar as you're active, your activity can only circulate around trying to influence the forces that actually are that act of once to determine the quality of your life on in contrast to an internal locus of control which is much more about your own powers talents capabilities engagement choices and so on which i think leads to a very much more active uh worldview and i think that uh, the way things are turning is that the the external locus of control seems to be coming be becoming the dominant model for a lot how a lot of people see life and that intersects i think very easily with a spectating mm -hmm. posture toward life because if all the forces are sort of out there and life is about spectating things that for the most part are out there well what then what happens when uh, someone faints on the sidewalk it becomes another thing that's out there mm -hmm. somehow and it's it, separated from from you from yes from your yeah, active yeah. engagement because the, the sort of range of your active engagement becomes so narrow over time. Like if you if you live an increasingly large fraction of your life in a spe spectating posture, then sort of the, the region that would be available for you to have active choice and agency, and I'm going to fling myself into this situation, that becomes very narrowed down. And I think the cost of that ultimately is that our world engagement, our engagement with each other, our capacity to help each other down life's road, or help each other in emergencies correspondingly gets narrowed down. <clears throat> well, and the, so there has to be some intention, especially if you tend to be more in the external locus of control, kind of, um, that's, your, that's your default. But there also can be, you can learn to be differently. Oh, yes, um, yes, I, I agree. So as to say, okay, well, that's, I don't know who that is, and that's none of my business, and I don't want to get sued, and blah, blah, blah. The list is endless. But you could also start the list with, what if that was my mother? How would I respond differently? And it's, it, you know, it could, it's somebody's loved one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's, that can help foster some intentionality about it. Um, now, I want to... Um, I, I'm going to switch gears just for a second because okay. I want, I would like to pick up on what you started with at the beginning of the video. And we had talked about before we started taping. Um, one of the most significant guys that most people have never heard of, uh, Alexander von Humboldt. He was, um, born in, I think 1765, 1767. Um, sort of a contemporary of Goethe and uh, highly, highly influential on Charles Darwin and uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau. Uh, a real luminary of the time. Yeah. And, and he went on a five-year odyssey through um, North America, Central America, South America, and uh, it was, it involved geology and geography and anthropology and archaeology and linguistics and 
Um, it was it was absolutely a five year whirlwind odyssey. I, is the best word I can think of for it. But what one of the things he came away with, and really spent the bulk of the years after that doing, is writing about and um, and lecturing and talking um, extensively about some of the uh, absolutely atrocious ways that we've treated one another, like the way the Spanish did with um, the peoples of Central and, and South America, um, the just destruction of cultures and infrastructure. Um, it's way, way beyond the scope of, of this, this video, but, but what he came away with was saying that how needful it is to have sort of a, a unified way of looking at the world, of being in the world, from these disciplines that now are so ultra-specialized that one discipline doesn't really know what the other discipline is doing and how they overlap in very significant ways, but they have no idea that that's so. Yeah, and you know, and, the, the thing that's striking me is you, as you talk about disciplines and the segmentation of different disciplines, it sounds so much like the segmentation between different human beings that mm. leads to the phenomenon you're talking about. That, you know, we're, it's sort of like, here's my little bailiwick and, and it never will it intersect with yours somehow, regardless yeah. of what happens to you. Yeah, although it intersects significantly. Oh, it does. But it's completely off our radar. Right, it's off it the radar. So. The perception is that there's no significant yeah. intersection. But I think you're right, Mark, when you talk about uh, when you were talking about von Humboldt's uh, sort of unified uh, theory that, that part of what is missing in our equation, I think, is a holistic uh, way of perceiving each other and life and so on. When you uh, perceive things holistically, then I, I think it's a lot easier to recognize the humanity in the other mm -hmm. and the suffering in the other and the sense of commonality that the person who has fainted on the sidewalk is not radically different from you mm -mm. that is that is you your condition too and one of these <laughs> days you're going to be the one lying on the sidewalk as a metaphor right you're going to be the one falling down because we all eventually do yeah we all you fall know down. and so then then the question is well you know how can we begin to sort of perceive more directly uh the un i would say the universe holistically and consequently each other in a much more intimate and integrated and i think in the final analysis compassionate way part of my own path in this uh regard has to do if you've watched any a lot of my videos i'm always talking about meditation and meditative consciousness and the fruits of cultivating meditative consciousness well one of the the fruits of doing that is uh that we open ourselves i think a little bit more to the perception the perception of anything really but Anything includes the perception of each other, mm -hmm. too. So I think one of the great <clears throat> fruits of developing and deepening our consciousness by way of a practice like meditation would be to cultivate the capacity to have a compassionate engagement and a, a sort of very sensitive perception of the other. So maybe a takeaway from this for us is the encouragement and the challenge to be intentional with that, to be to, to develop a sense of mindfulness about being in relation to the other, to, to one another. And on the other side is um, also a being aware of and a embracing rather than being, a, a being fearful of the darkness that's within us, that the unknown and the misfortune that is a part of us, whether we are willing to look at it or not. Oh, I think that's true, you know, and that's why I'm always sort of glad that you're bringing up the psychoanalytic perspective on things, which always emphasizes um, that we grow as a function of our contact with our inner darkness and what we want to repress and what we want to ignore and what we don't want to see and so on and so forth. But one, another one of the somewhat scary parts of meditative practice is that it'll get you in touch with that <laughs> very quickly because uh, one of the things that happens as you quiet down on the inside is that things that you repress become much more perceptible mm -hmm. right that they can bubble into your awareness much more quickly so in a way you know like meditating has i think 
part of the effect of something like psychoanalysis, not the full effect, but at least part of the effect, because it can help you get in touch with uh, the darkness and so on and so forth. That would that would keep you ultimately paralyzed. We are paralyzed as a function of what we repress, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> like what we allow into our awareness and what we allow to frighten us and scare us and threaten us. And in the process, uh, how we develop the courage to face that and enter into that and ultimately integrate that, uh, you know, Jung's fancy word for this is individuation, how we become human beings in a deep sense, you know, is, and is it, it, um, it fosters that fosters um, interaction. Yes, right. And it fosters the kind of perception that would provide a counterweight to all this sort of distant spectating sort of relation where someone someone suffering on the street or fainting on the street all of a sudden becomes just another spectacle, just another video to watch, you know? So, so we travel not as alone, lonely individuals in our own little bubble, but as fellow journer, sojourners together. Yeah, I mean, that. I think, um, and that sounds like such a high bar, like when you say it that way, for, probably from most people's point of view, it's like, wow, like developing the sense that we're fellow sojourners, you know, but if, it, if the bar sounds too high, maybe the prescription would be, well, just try it, like take it as a joke, maybe, you know, like an interesting sort of joke that you might, oh yeah, you know, like being on the road, like recognizing other people's humanity, that's really funny, I know, right? You know, like take it as a kind of joke and that can be a way. See, I, I'm a great believer in the power of humor and jokes and laughter in a psychological way. Well, and that's a powerful tool. And another powerful tool as a way into this is a small, are the small things. For example, um, just a smile mm. to, to someone in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. Just a hello, how are you? In a sincere way. Yeah, I think it's easy to underrate the power of that. Um, so you're involved. You're involving yourself in that other person, but you're doing it in a, in a way that would be less, maybe scary or off-putting for you. Yeah, like a baby step. But it's practice. Oh, it is. It is practice. And and we're both musicians. I don't know if you know this, but we're both sort of, uh, you know many years playing music Piano. and uh, yeah. boy it, when you when you're when you live that way you get a deep appreciation for the power of practice and repetition and so on and i think you're right mark like that is not a bad way of practicing meditation would be another way of practicing but even like recognizing the humanity and people that you would just pass by or treat like robots like in the supermarket or something the person putting cans on the shelf mm -hmm. you know you have a an opportunity to connect with someone's humanity as you as you check out at Kroger, let's say, yeah. So um, let's let's look for those little things, and not just look for ways. them, but live them. If we can live them, yeah. you know, incorporating. Them. Yeah, it's a wonderful opportunity. Yes. I agree with you, Mark. Like the, the every day, that's where that's that's where it really the, the the rubber meets the road is in the everydayness of our lives, where we we have every single day we have opportunities to practice. You know, I, I just came from Home Depot where I had to buy some springs to raise a guitar, not the guitar, the garage door. See, I am a musician, right? The garage door up. And I had an interaction, a human interaction with the woman uh, cashier, you know? Yeah. And what a wonderful thing it was. You know, normally, normally it's so easy to sort of pass by those people and just treat them as functionaries somehow. And like, why? Why would we do that? Why would we do that? And those are always significant. If we make them significant, yes. Um, for both. Yes, for both. For both people. And, and she, I could tell uh, when I interacted with this woman that, uh, you know, she felt genuine joy in the interaction. Like her, her experience was elevated. My experience as a shopper at Home Depot was elevated because that's the power of the Home Depot. And one of the ways I think we try to buy, we try to do this, but we do it in a bypassing sort of way is like um, if you're in the drive through at Starbucks and somebody pays, somebody says, I'm going to pay for the people behind me. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Right? And so then that's all over the people behind them. That's all over their Facebook for two days yeah. of how wonderful. And I'm going to pass it forward to. And who, who did that for you? Yeah. Did you, yeah. did you have a direct? So that's nice. I'm not, I'm not disparaging that at all, but I'm saying there's a, another level that can be taken to a very significant, meaningful level in looking the other person in the eye and having a direct personal uh, um, you know, dialogue point of contact. Yeah. yeah, point of contact. You know, Martin Buber, uh, we were both talking about Martin Buber last semester in the university, um, has a, sort of a neat way of, of describing this. Uh, he describes it in terms of saying thou, like that ancient sort of word, like sort of quasi-religious word, like saying thou to the other one, not just like you, in the sense of uh, sort of the uh, yeah. perfunctory type sense, you know, but saying like having a moment, at least now and then, I would say like maybe 10 moments a day. See if you can have, okay, here's my exercise for you that viewer. see if you can have 10 moments in a day where you say thou to someone or even an animal, could be an animal theoretically, like say thou to your cat or dog, instead of just taking your cat or dog for granted or your spouse or your family or whoever it is that's around your friend. The guy you're making a video with, thou, Mark, thou, Yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and that will, even if you say it to yourself, it will have the effect of making you look more deliberately and more intentionally at the interactions that occur around you every day. Yeah, if you can make it a practice. I think, see, when you have the idea of practicing, I think that is exactly the right idea like practicing at the everyday level. Because, see, the, pro the problem with discussions like this is they, that they can end up being so high-flown and the ideas seem so grandiose in a way that it can, seem, it can seem unattainable or too distant or something like that. And I think, actually, the opposite is the case. It's, sure. But, but for, to really make a practice out of it, I think you're, you're right when you say, man, you've got to start looking at the everydayness of yeah. it. Like, how can you say thou your dog or your cat or the person at Kroger or a friend or whoever in the everyday. Well, and that's what I've always said is the significance of the mundane. Yes, yes. So people, there's a general perception of even of that word that it's, um, it's ordinary or it's, um, you know, it's, it's inferior or in some way it's, it's less than. Yeah, take it for granted. And, to me, the mundane is some of the most significant moments that, that you can experience. Having that moment with your, with your beloved pet mm -hmm. or with your beloved partner or with your, you know, some, something like that during the day, um, it seems at first glance as just a mundane occurrence. But it's really, it's not just ordinary, it's extraordinary. Yeah, and it's a matter of shifting our perception. Yeah, it's the perception. To be able to perceive that, so, you know, Blake kind of famously said, you know, it's possible to see the world in a grain of sand or heaven in a wild flower, you know? So, uh, and I think that's the task because in reality, we don't like to acknowledge this. Every moment is a grain of sand. Every mm -hmm. moment is a wild flower. So the question is not whether, whether every moment is going to have its uh, potential for us to really live deeply and powerfully, that's going to be the case no matter what. The only real question is whether we're going to find it within ourselves. How we take to, it up. Yes, to shift our perspective yeah. and to yeah. dare ourselves beyond the ordinary in order to see the moments of our lives like grain of sand, like wildflowers. Um, well, I don't want to overstay my visit with you, but... Okay, yes. Every um, moment, clock is ticking. This moment, also a grain of sand. <laughs> See the world. And that moment, like George Carlin. And that moment. And it's gone. And it's gone. Each yeah. moment. So live those moments with intention. That's. Yeah. I think that will be my takeaway for all of us today. Or at least try. Try it out. See if it works for you. If it doesn't work, you can leave it behind. In any case, thanks for joining us uh, today. And I uh, hope you benefited. I feel like I have, so we'll see you next time.
Take care now. That was pretty good. Yeah.